What's up? My name is Ruben Ronde and you're watching or listening to a new episode of State of Trance podcast. And in the studio today, we have someone from Denmark. I think that's the first time we ever have one of those uh, guys here in the studio. We welcome Morten Brum, aka Morten. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, I'm great. Is this the first Danish person you have in the studio? I'm pretty sure this is the first Danish person in the studio, yeah. Wow, I'm honored. Are you? Really? Yeah, I am. I, 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 I would think there has been others here, but no? No. No. Okay. Well, I take it. <laughs> I haven't lived in Denmark for 14 years, but I guess I still, still a sort, still a sort of Danish person. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very Danish. <laughs> yeah. Because nowadays you live in Portugal. We'll get that um, yeah. a little bit later. So in this podcast, we always like to dive a little bit into the history of the artist that is visiting visiting us, and we also have some fan questions for you as well. So let's start at the very start. How did Morten Brand become Morten the DJ? I started when I was 13 year, years old in a youth club uh, in the city where I was born, Aarhus in Denmark. And you could uh, go to a DJ school at night. There was this guy from London. Mm -hmm. He was teaching the kids how to scratch and how to mix on turntables. And I started that class and I became a DJ. And um, when I was 15, I, I finally got some, some Denon, that's what we called them back then, CD players at home. And I would... Uh, DJ every day and uh, as the age of 17 I got my my first show at a club and uh, since then I DJed every single weekend and when I was 21 I met up with uh, Rune RK uh, yeah. today his name is Kirsch mm -hmm. and we did a record together in Denmark and that record became the biggest dance record in Denmark for yeah I think until now it, it's still the the biggest record that's that's been in Denmark and we created like a culture and a community around dance music and we toured the country for for years and um this uh, pop duo in Denmark called Nick and Jay they uh they collaborated with me and they brought me on tour with them and from there on uh, I had a, a beautiful career in Denmark and when I turned 30 I uh I I sold very big shows in Denmark and 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 Denmark is a kind of small country, so to yeah. challenge myself more and to be better at making music and, and maybe try to to see if it could uh, work more on a global scene than just Denmark, I moved to LA and I lived in LA for 12 years. Um, and the last two years of living in LA, I uh, made some records that I presented for David Guetta mm -hmm. and he fell in love with it. And together we started a project that we called Future Rave. And now we are like... 20 or 22 records later we are uh, we we uh, have a record label together <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, we, it's funny that i had a whole list of years and everything that oh, happened sorry. in the meantime but you kind of skipped through it already <laughs> oh, so, I'm sorry. so that was yeah, the podcast right. for today thank you so much for tuning in <laughs> no. yeah okay but that was just uh i thought you said like how, how no no, how no it's, it's fine and i mean 100 percent. just what that's why i let you go as well because uh you gave yeah. like a very brief a uh, brief story of what what is Morton basically, but I'm very curious. Like when you were 13 years old and you started DJing, what triggered you to become a DJ? Like were you listening to dance music on the radio, or were you just fascinated by some other DJ that you saw that you were like, "Hey, I want to do this as well." Yeah, you know, you know, I'm 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 turning 42 now, so it's quite some years ago. You know, I almost been DJing for 30 years, and back then we were very inspired by Prodigy, JG, Plastic Dreams, Sandcastles. These these records that we sample today, and it was a different way of, of making electronic music. We also listened to a lot of trance and hard style, you know, space frog and all this like dance music that, that kind of went for it. But it wasn't like we only played electronic music or set. We could play hip hop, we could play pop, we could play a lot of things. But what, what triggered you to start DJing? That you were like, okay, is this... because. You saw someone DJing, I guess, or you were just intrigued by the thought of becoming a DJ and presenting music to other people. I mean, I came from a very musical house. Okay. My dad, he played every instrument. I I played it in a band. I, I went to music school to learn to play flute and these things. I, I, I had to play music with my dad. Now I say I had to, but I really had to play music with my dad, with the piano and the flute, yep. the violin and the guitar uh, once or twice a week. 
So music has always been inc incorporated in in my the way I was raised, you know. Yeah. Um, but really, like my big interest was playing soccer, football when I grew up. But after 13 years old, my dream was just to be a DJ. There's nothing I thought was more fun than play a record in front of other people and 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 introducing people to music that I love. Yeah, which is still thing. the biggest high today, <laughs> you know. Definitely. So you started DJing. You already explained a brief history of your of your rise. Um, well, let's go through some of the points that I wrote down and like, hey, these, these are monumental moments in your career. Um, the release of your album, Drop. Yeah, wow. Because I was, I, I texted, no, we spoke uh, earlier. Um, you were texting me. I was like, hey, um, heads in your music right now. And that was one of the things that I was listening to, Drop. Tell us about your first album, 2009 or 2010. Yeah, it, it, was, um, it was fun because um, my old manager, He told me like, listen, you need to start making music. Uh, we, we need to to try to elevate this. I was only 20 years old. And I was like, but I don't know anything. Well, I set you up with this producer and, and just try to learn for him and see what you can do. You already had the musical knowledge, so that yeah, helps a lot. Yeah, 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 true. It made it easier. But more, I think, important at that time for me is I had already found out what kind of music in electronic music I liked. Yeah. And I didn't know that it would be a thing to produce, uh, to pursue, to have a record that people love. Yeah, I just wanted to make music that I love. I didn't really care. I didn't know that it was a thing that people needed to love it. I didn't know that it was a thing that it needed to be a business for a record label or it needed to be uh, uh, something important to have support. So we went into the studio. We back then smoked a lot of weed and we didn't go outside <laughs> for two weeks. Yeah. And then we had 14 records that we loved. And um, we were like, uh, okay, so what do we do? Well, we make an album. But back then you didn't make an album. Dance music, you didn't make an album. No, I mean, you make singles, that's it, yeah. Yeah, and it was like, who's going to release it? Because back then the dance label for, in Denmark, or, or, there wasn't a dance label. And 2009 was a bad time for the music industry. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know. When In Denmark, it was not so easy to just release dance music, you know. So we did a release party at the city where I was from. And everyone who came to the release party, instead of paying an entrance, they would buy the album. Ah. So automatically we sold like 2,000 albums on the first night. Okay, smart. And then we kind of had people's attention, which was... Because you were charting straight away. Yeah, and like, okay, we sold 2,000 physical copies. This is a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. For this young DJ, you know. So then things kind of started a little bit for me. And then the media, not the media, but the one who wrote about the album, everyone was like talking bad about it. But the culture embraced it. And that was cool because people loved it. And this was not like songs that you hear back then. You'd be like, wow, this is going to be a club banger. But this had a cultural impact. And I could tour the country and every club and every festival would be completely packed. So, yeah. so the press and the media were like, okay, whatever. This album doesn't mean a lot. But yeah, in, the meantime, yell in, in the underground, people were embracing yeah, it. Yeah, they were yelling at me saying I produced using a lot of samples and it wasn't original and blah, blah, which is probably right. But it sounded nice and it was... Not well done, but it had a lot of passion to it. And I yeah. think it went through. And um, yeah, then I, I, I really got into uh, to making music and, and try to collaborate with other artists and try to find my sound. Mm -hmm. That kind of de determined my sound. And I'm pretty sure anyone who hear that drop album from 2009... You will hear Future Rave. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's that, because that surprised me. I was like, hey, wait a minute. Hey, this sounds already like the music that you're doing right now. Yeah. So, and I think that's important, especially uh, in my situation, because I I love to collaborate with producers and yeah. I love to collaborate with other artists. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's very important that people who follow my music they can hear always when I'm collaborating with someone or yeah. I'm working with a different Your producer. Your mind and spirit is into the songs. Yeah. yeah, that's important for me. Yeah. Why do you like to work with other producers then? So is it? Some um, synergy, synergy that you're looking yeah, for? Yeah, and to put me in a studio alone for two weeks is is it's just like my, like it's, I, I, I don't know, it's just like... You bang your head against the wall. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, it's like, I, yeah, I just would like to, to, to have the feeling of making music with someone else is the, the best. The energy, the excitement that you find something that's... Yeah, something you know, like. you know, I, I used to go in studio with um, this hip hop group, this is crazy story but this hip-hop group called 808 mafia in in america 
And these are like these uh, producer gangsters from Atlanta that make some of the biggest hip hop records in in America, right? The beats. And I used to go to the studio with them and there would be like 20 people in the studio, yeah. all crazy. But sit there and make beats with them and everyone is jumping and celebrating and drinking was like the vibe, like, wow. That's how I can totally picture that already. But that's how I yeah. really love it. I like to make music like it's I'm at a club. Yeah. To sit quiet, like uh, I like the, the to share that. You hear that? Like this is exciting. Bounce of the energy. Yeah, yeah I love people. that. I love it. I'm not so much into now in my older days. I'm really into the dynamic of mixing and mastering and more technical stuff. Um, but but it, my DNA is more. To, to create the feelings and, and, and the, the, the shape of the record direction. I like the idea. Yeah. And bouncing ideas. And, sh and I understand because when you sit down in the studio with someone else, you really feed off the energy of the other person as well. And also you come up with other ideas that you would do by yourself. Because you would always pick the same road that you normally pick. Like, I'll use these kind of chords. But if you sit with someone else, they're like, hey, maybe you should try this. And you're like, hey, yeah. wait a minute. Yeah. And, and also, I think I haven't, I haven't got excited enough about. Okay, now I'm gonna dive into this track and not leave it for two days just to get everything correct. Mm. I'm more like, okay, I have an idea. Let's work on it. You know, let's yeah. you know, I, let, let's finish it. But ah, it's not for me to sit and choose a kick for eight hours. Or <laughs> but it's just not. You know, it's like okay. I, I, It's, it's more, let's create, let's, let's go on to the next, let's, let's try it. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Also, the, uh, before we move on, I just want to uh, share one thing because I remember in 2009, when you dropped, uh, drop, I remember driving down to Copenhagen to Sensation where you played as yeah, well. Yeah, that's true. That I, I have never been more nervous in my life for that show. That was an epic event. I, yeah. I remember driving there uh, with... We had to drive over these bridges and I don't know, we drove in the middle of the night. So halfway I had to stop the car just to sleep yeah, just yeah. a little bit. But I was so excited to see. But uh, that's, you were really passionate. You, you came from Holland to drive to Copenhagen to go to a dance Yes, event. yes. That's, that's, that's Because it was sensation, crazy. you know, and it was yeah. really, and, and it was, I remember sensations going around the world, taking the concept along. And it was just such an epic feeling of, of going to parties like that with such yeah. a diverse lineup that yeah. you don't really see too much anymore. Yeah, yeah. But, but but back then, you know, it, it, it was like, there, I think there were 35,000 people in the national arena in Denmark. It was massive. A and you don't get that platform as a DJ in the early 2000s. No. There was only Armin van Buuren and Chesto and David Guetta who played these shows. Yeah. So for the rest of us to get on that stage, it was mind-blowing. You know, and I was playing right before the Swedish House Mafia, or Axwell, or Sepp, or who, who, some, some of the people from the Swedish House Mafia. And, you know, I was the, the national hero You yeah. know, the guy from Denmark that they put on. And uh, yeah, it was insane. <laughs> it was Good memories, 100%. Insane. Yeah, yeah. So you already uh, told as well that you stepped away from, from being in Denmark. You moved to the US. You started producing over there. Uh, actually, I came across a release on Armada thrice in yes. 2015. Yes. Himalaya. Yeah, it's true. A, 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 a amazing record for me. I loved that record. Yeah. So that was the first link that you had with coming here in the office as well, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, from that moment on, listening to your music, there's a lot of things happening. Yeah. Because suddenly after that song, uh, you had kids with Steve Aoki still. Yeah. But then you switched to dubstep. Yeah. I was like, hey, wait a minute. What happened here? Yeah. There's a story to all of it. Um, Because you went from... EDM or future kind of rave already back in the day so yeah. to play to to making dubstep. Right? Yeah. So I think I think the honest version like the 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 truth is that I lived in LA and I was completely lost of where do I want to go m musically. Yeah. And I saw everyone connecting with dubstep at this time so I was like, "Ha, huh, okay, um Let me get a hold of this guy. He's amazing with dubstep. It has like a little bit of a hip hop vibe to it that I kind of like. Let's work. And I knew nothing about dubstep. Yeah. So I went in the studio for one month with this guy. He His name is now Sullivan King, which yeah. is a beast on this scene. And we'd start banging out tracks. And I released one or two of these tracks. And I started to play dubsteps in my shows, which was like a little weird for me. But it was the trend in America. It was huge at this yeah. time. And I was very confused. I didn't know where to go musically. And after that period, you probably hear me starting making hip-hop music. Yeah. 
And um, yeah, with Dave East, family, and tonight yeah. I'm loving you with yeah. Leo Craig. And it. actually, like that track with Dave East, I'm very proud of that track. It's a I, good song. I think it's an amazing song. I think it's it's cool, and I think he's a very cool artist. Not easy to get him on a on, on a record. Um, and I was so lost. Like I was like, okay, I love this, but. Imagine you go to my show and I just released a hip hop song. It's weird. What are you playing? What are you doing? Yeah. Um, so I think there was some years, I know there was some years here where I was completely out of it and I had no idea what to do. And I, and it went so off track for me. Yeah. Far which, away from what you were. Like yes. Like a dance music lover. Yes. Where it, it was so wrong. And that was such a good thing because then I was like, okay, this is so bad. When it went well for me, what did I do? Yeah. Yeah. And then I went back. So you went back to your core, back well, to yeah. the roots. Yeah. But would you recommend like young people like having that period or would you just be like, okay, stick to what you love and just I, do I, that? I mean, like this is a very, you know, like an Instagram moment of like, what do you do? So <laughs> no, the, but like, it's, I know, some but, people say it's about the journey. You yeah. Know, so. it, 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 but, but, but here's the thing. If I could change everything, then I would... 20 years ago, made a few songs and went to David Guetta and be like, hey, well, check this out. And he would be like, I love this. Let me work with you and develop the sound with you and develop you as an artist. That would have been the easiest way. Yeah. I would have got 15 years of struggling in America. But maybe then David would have said, I don't like this. And maybe I different times, so you weren't know. able to make that before I struggled. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, me looking back at the times I struggled, I struggled, yeah. But uh, we all struggle periods in our life, especially with music and yeah. stuff with being an artist it's okay, life is tough and, and making music is tough. And would I change it today if I could? Maybe, maybe that. You yeah. know, I, I made hip hop, I made dubstep, I made a lot of different things and it was important for me to go that way to become the, the artist that I am today. It's okay. Yeah. yeah but I is agree. it confusing? Uh, for sure, but, <laughs> yeah, but, but if you matter. think it's confusing, try to be in my head. <laughs> you know. That is true. Well, like you said, in in 2019, that's that's when you went back to your roots, I guess. Because when I was listening to your music, the, me and you, that was the first one that is basically shaping up where you are right now. And you know, the cool thing was with me and you was like, okay, I'm just going to try to make something that feels good and I want to play in my set. Yeah. And then I made me and you and I played a show in San Francisco. And when I played me and you, the whole crowd was like, wow. What is that? Yeah. yeah, and I was like, this is the feeling you get when you create something people love. I completely forgot. Yeah. Like, I I forgot the feeling of playing new music people don't know and getting excited about the reaction. Yeah. And I was like, that is it. What am I doing? And from that, it was easy. Ah, okay. I think what you did is you went from behind the trends in front of the trends. That's what you did. Just by following your heart. Because in the, when you, yeah, like you yeah, said, you, right. were, yeah. you were doing dubstep, maybe you were yeah. following trends. You but, didn't really know what to do. So you were like, okay, everybody's doing this, so let's yeah, do this. It's true. And in 2018, 19, you made the jump from, I'm just going to do whatever I do. I'm going to lead the pack instead of following it. Yeah, but I didn't I didn't make music to try to lead the pack because I didn't know it was going to lead the pack. I just made music that I thought was cool yeah. and that I liked. And I, I think it's very important that we follow what's going on on the scene. Mm -hmm. You know, I f see and hear a lot of producers who are stuck in the past and doing things where I'm like, you only do this because I think that the imprint you're getting is not what's going on right now. You need to go to Ibiza. You need to go to UK. Yeah, you need yeah. to go to America. You need to feel where's the audience at because these sounds, we heard them too much. Yeah. These methods, we they are too play out. We need something fresh the world people want something fresh yeah but what is fresh you know we never know and we get inspired by others who produced and we try to incorporate in that and make it our own yeah but the second we just try to make something that we really like then it's like fresh fresh you know if you if you make something that appeals to a bigger crowd i guess because sometimes you would make something and then you're like okay this is i love this but this is so weird you know Yes, but, but also, that's fine also. But also it's a balance because I feel like me and David did something that inspired a lot of people yep. in the dance scene. And then we rushed to move forward. But also we created this kind of sound and this feeling. Why is everyone taking advantage of it? And we're moving on. Why don't we take a step back and also create more of the music that we really loved and brought us here? Yeah. So it's also a balance of like, what are you doing? Where are you going? 
But in the end of the day, there's no right and wrong. Music right. is like art. You love it? Great, man. Then it's amazing. I don't like it. But that doesn't mean that you're wrong. Yeah. It's, it's just about creating and, and making something that you love. And if you love it, I'm, I mean, there's so, it, most of the times, if you love some, something, there's an audience for that. Yeah. yeah. You see it also with like a lot of like classic albums from back in the day when they were brought out. A lot of people didn't like them and people would like, even the media would piss on them. And now they're classics. Now people see yeah. it as like a step forward in yeah. music. Yeah, yeah. So in the end, if you follow your heart and do what you love, then yeah. you can never really lose, right? No, no, true, true. Yeah. And it was really cool because that dubstep guy I work with, uh, Solomon King, he was mixing dubstep and heavy metal And when we were sitting together, I remember he was like struggling. I'd be like, no one listened to my music. I put it on SoundCloud. No one cares. And he is so talented. Like, yeah. He's a monster producer, like really, really talented. And his sound was so unique. And we had these discussions and I kept telling him like, don't change, man. Just keep where you are. And then out of the blue, man, snap. Now he sell 10,000 tickets, whatever city he goes to. He's a monster now. He just stayed through and suddenly it was like his time. Boom. Stay cool. unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah stay unique. You that's cool. Uh, you already mentioned that um, from that moment on, from me and you, it was a big pivotal moment. After that, you also started working with uh, David Guetta. Um, you started the Future Rave movement. Well, there's a, I, I saw a lot of nice stories how you met David Guetta in the gym, right? Yeah, yeah. I met him in LA in the gym. Yeah. I, I, I met him a few times, but he don't remember. So we <laughs> said the gym. That's just how it goes, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, So you started working th together, you started a label together, you started a movement together. Um, just keep it short. The moment from me and you to the first release together with David, uh, which is Never Be Alone. Yeah. What happened in that short period of time? Well, well, David has always been supporting me even though we didn't make music together. He would allow me to open for him in Ibiza. He would allow me to open for him different places around the world, uh, Las Vegas and LA, yeah. so on. Which is a big thing when you are... Uh, an upcoming artist when the, the 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 bigger guys help you and and he would give me feedback on my records so yeah. he's always been helping me before we start mus making music together so we were friends i would hang out with him in the beach and do stuff yeah so this period of time when i sent him a few instrumentals they were very basic and they needed development and that's what he went went in and helped me with yeah he helped me add music to my music to we have a certain layer of emotions and he brought in like next level you know songwriting with aloe black and ray and and you know made chord progression how we know david getter you know big feelings in the breakdowns and like his his understanding of creating these emotional moments is just amazing yeah so developing the records we did together was a big part of it that took time between me and you and, and our first release yeah and from our first release was that um Never Be Alone with Aloe Black in 2019. Then it was just full-on beast mode. Try to do everything I can, could, to create as much music for us to work on uh, for Future Wave and me and David. Me and him, we would work on music like two, three times a week. So it started out as one track, sorry. <coughs> yeah, yeah. But did you already have the intention on beforehand also with David to just start this whole movement or was it just because it worked out nicely, we're going to do some more? No, that's a good question. No, nothing was planned. It was, and also I think that's why it felt so organic. You know, the the thing with Future Wave came along because that when we came on Beatport, they charted us at the big room chart. Yeah. And I was annoyed, and I kept telling David, "Why are they putting us in a big room chart? It's yeah. not big room. We we're not doing big room. We are big room is the biggest thing right now, and we are not doing big room. I'm so annoyed. Why don't they make a new genre for us? We call it, call it Future Wave. Yeah. And we were both like. I like that name. <laughs> you know, I like that name a lot. Sounds and we were like, future, we call it Future best. Rave. The sound we're doing is Future Rave. And you know, we made some t-shirts and David, he played a show in uh, in Miami where he did for charity. He, I think he called it United at Home. Where, yeah. he, where he played, he did like a charity where he played in front of, I don't know how many of, millions of people around the world. That was in the beginning of the Corona lockdown. Exactly. Yeah. It was unbelievable. And he jumped in a Future Rave t-shirt. And I remember sitting and watching it live and like, oh my God, he's wearing a Future Rave t-shirt. <laughs> it was so sick. And I could just see all the comments like, holy shit, the Future Rave t-shirt. What is Future Rave? How do I get the t-shirt? Blah, blah. And that was really amazing moment for us because 
we didn't brand it as something. It was just like, what is that? Yeah. And then the fans, they, they made it theirs. Yeah. And we would see everywhere people would comment, future wave, future wave, future wave, future wave. We were like, holy shit. This is fucking, sorry, this is, That's right. this is crazy. <laughs> because it, we didn't put it into people's throat. We didn't tell them, this is hot, this is future wave. It was like the fans told us, yo, what are you doing? It's, it's future wave, this is sick. They just grabbed it. And then we were like onto it. I love that. I think that's also, I saw a couple of interviews of, of David also talking about you, um, that you basically bro brought a lot of fun into his life, just making music, not for the charts, but for dance floors. Is that correct? Yeah. I think, you know, like, I'm, I, 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 yeah, it's nice of him to say that, but also the other way around because David is, uh, David, David Getter, you know, he, he makes big records. He's yeah. a, he's a, big engine you know it's like he, he makes songs the whole world dance to but he's also like he, he's when it comes to making music he's an 18 year old kid you yeah. know i i go in the studio with him and he beats that and we're working on a record that is 30 percent done and he put it on a usb stick and he runs to the car and he jumps on stage literally 15 minutes later he plays Ishwaya in front of 12,000 people. <laughs> and he, that song. <laughs> and he opening with that record, yeah. looking at me, laughing, like, this is crazy, you know? <laughs> Completely excited. That energy is unbelievable. And I think those people who've been to the studio with Geta, songwriters or producers, he's unmatched in a studio. Yeah. He's unbelievably passionate and super talented. So everyone is like, wow, let's create the best music we ever heard. He gets the best out of people. I think he really does. Yeah. And he got the best out of me. And he do still today because it's so inspiring and so fun to make music with someone who's so passionate about dance music mm -hmm. and music in general. And I think the biggest hobby in David Guetta's life is beyond everything. His After his family is music. Yeah. He dies. He and breathes and everything. Oh my God. It's like if I send him a record... Or if he has an idea, he's like, like he's on fire, man. You don't understand. So, so okay, it's fun for him to make music with me, but that's because he makes it so fun. You know, like I'm making music with David Guetta. It's unbelievable. Yeah, but he should be thinking I'm making music with Morton. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yeah, I no, so. it's cool. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 are, we have a lot the same taste and that's why it's fun. It helps a lot, yeah. You know. He released uh, two EPs together. Um, is there a third one in the making as well? Or is it just like, okay, we don't plan anything. We just make music together and just see what, what happens. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, David had a world hit with um, I'm Good. Yeah. And uh, I think that took a lot of time from him of like massive media, massive shows. Everything was like, boom. Like yeah. when you have a number one record in the world, it was like massive. And he had massive follow-up records with that. I started touring for the first time in my life. So I played six, seven shows a week the last two years. Yeah. Like I've been touring like... Whenever no the lockdown was over, you were like, okay, I'm, I'm never going home. Bye. Yeah, first <laughs> time I could tour with this music, I would only play my own music in my sets. This was like, wow. So we haven't had that much time the last two years to make music, yeah. but now we're back. And now we're like having super much fun again. So we have a few records coming out. We have uh, uh, tons of uh, sessions set up and we're excited about making music again. And a lot of shows together. A lot of shows. We have tons of shows in the beach side. We have a big show in Denmark, at a bit, which is crazy for the me. The first future rave party in Denmark. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm from Denmark, so it's, it's, it's going to be crazy to be in front of everyone I know there with him. Mm -hmm. So excited. Awesome. Um, your label, Future Rave, also kicked off. Um, started with Element. And also one release by Sander van Dorn, also by Prophecy. And yeah. you played one of Pro the Prophecy's tracks in your guest mix, which yeah. is an ID ID. Yeah. What else is coming on the label in the future? Besides your own music, maybe. Yeah, so we want to release our own music on the label and we want to... Um, the whole idea with, with making a label was to, to push culture and be part of, you know, the, the cultural impact that you have here at State of Trance and with Armada and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of dance labels do so well with pushing this culture and we want to be a part of that. The truth is, it's been a little bit of a hard start for us. Yeah, It's very hard, I think, to to sign a record that defines the direction and the sound you want to go. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of work. And me and him, we spend all our time on making music and touring. So on the other hand, also have uh, spend time on helping producers to develop their sound and finishing songs with them 
so it fits the direction and what we would do want to do on a label. I think it's a little bigger for me. It's a little bigger task than I anticipated. But now I think we came to an agreement that we just want to release music that we love and think is fun and not overthink it yeah. and just take it day by day instead of being like, okay, this is what we have to do. Now we have Forcing a label. yourself to find music that you don't really like, but you like it enough to release. Yeah. It. So now we have a setup that if we find things we love. We can release it and we can push it and we can we can be a part of it. So, um, yeah, day by day. So you don't know yet what's going to come in the near future? No, now I tried that new one with Prophecy. It, it felt pretty good. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's I really think you good. should sign it, to be honest. Yeah, it's really good. It's really good. Uh, uh, I have a few other things and I, I love people sending me records and uh, we'll see. Another big thing that I need to address because I'm watching your socials in the last couple of weeks, the Boom Boom Army. Yeah. The mer merchandise drops. Yeah. So in the meantime, you're touring the world, but you also have an apparel brand. Yeah. Which sells out in six hours. Yeah, it, it was a good start. We rebranded it. Uh, it used to be a big part of what I, I have been doing in, in, in the last 10 years. Uh, lately, the last two years, there hasn't been a, a lot of time to do other things, but I'm very passionate about... Uh, this brand Boom Boom Army because it, it's like Future Rave. It just became its own thing yeah. that the young people love to wear and and to be a part of this. And now we are back and 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 just making some some things we th we think is fun. And uh, thank you for bringing it up. Um, so yeah, we launched uh, last Friday, and um, and now we're shipping it to people all over the world. Which Did you really expect that it would blow up like that? Uh I could feel it felt good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I felt there was a buzz, like there was something happening. Yeah. And like, I, you see your DM and everyone is asking, where can I buy this? Yeah, where yeah, can yeah, I yeah. buy it? So we kind of knew that there was like, people would like this. So it's fun. Awesome. Yeah. It's fun to be a part of something. I like this a lot. Yeah. I think that's also why we enjoy in State of Trance so much because it's like, it's such it's a, a family. community. Yeah. 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 And you, you know, the trans community has always, stood out as the strongest dance community in the world, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, I remember going to Armin van Buuren show in, um, in Los Angeles 10 years ago, and there would be like 10,000 or 15,000 people in the form, the, the, the concert venue in LA. And the fans were just like the most diehard fans ever. It's really unbelievable. And this yeah. community is... Uh, it's yeah, we're nice. blessed, 100%. Yeah, 100%. it's very, very nice. And it's funny you say that because I also wrote down that I see that you visit a lot of shows. If you don't have to play yourself, you visit a lot of shows of other artists as well. You went to Elenium uh, yeah, two yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. Sold out two nights in yeah. the Bank of America Stadium, I think. Yeah, it's crazy. Like 50,000 tickets. Insane. Every, yeah. Insane. Uh, is it something that you do? Also, Vancouver, where we went together to Armin. Yeah. Is it something that you do out of passion for the music or is it also a little bit of homework? Or? Yeah, it's a mix. I think it's very important to see what's going on. Like I, 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 um, I think it's very important to, to dig into different cultures and see in dance music what's going on. Yeah. And especially when you have a guy like Elinium that in America sells to His so fan fight. base is unbelievable. Yeah, so what are the dynamics? Why is he selling out 50,000 tickets two nights in a row. Like, yeah. because nobody else does that. Yeah. So why is, what is he doing? What's going on? What is his music? What is his production? This is very important for me to come and experience. I want to be a part of it. I want to feel it and yeah. not just see a video on YouTube. Same way I went to see with you. We went to see and see Armin, you know. Yeah. Why has Armin been on top of the game for two, three decades now? Yeah. Why is he so good on stage? What's, what's he doing? It's very important for me to to see and feel this music. Same as it is to go to a small club in in Berlin or in Copenhagen or go out in the pizza, even though I'm not playing a show. It's yeah. important. I think it's important to keep the uh, connection with the dance floor as well. Yeah. Not only as a DJ, but also as an, as yeah. an yeah. audience. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. Awesome. And what is your obsession with polar beers? Before we go to the question. Of the uh, <laughs> you know, uh, when we started, it was just more like, uh, when I was a kid, I had a polar bear as a toy. I know I always saw my career before I met David, like as a polar bear, I always just like walk alone. I'm from the North. It's like, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, I just like a polar bear. It's cool. And it's extinguishing. They're not extinguish. There's not many left. So, yeah. so and I'm from Scandinavia, you know, it's kind of cold and fair point. Yeah. It's a little bit of a mascot, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Let's dive into some of the, the questions that came into Instagram. 
Um, Dr. Oscillator wants to know how would you suggest growing uh, to make a living of music? So how would you suggest up and coming artists to get mm. into a certain space that you can live of making music? I mean, the end of the day, if you want to tour, you need to create a demand. So you need to make music that people want to listen to and they want to come to your show. Yeah. They come to your show, the the business is kind of rolling and yeah. you can get paid because you sell the tickets. On the music side, if you want to make music that streams and that's a business, then I don't think I'm the right person to ask yet because I'm so focusing now on making music that I like to play at a show. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of people who are really good at making music that streams a lot, and 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 um, and um, yeah, I I I I think you know you you need to to do the time, you know, you need to work. Put in really the effort, hard. put in the time. Yeah, there's so many people who wants to make a living out of making music, and and those who who really uh, stand out, I think they put in the time. Yeah, and it's really hard to make a living of music. For a lot of people. It's very hard. Yeah. Of course it is. <clears throat> because it also, even touring costs a lot of money as it's well. It's very yeah. hard. And also, we are on the same stage as these superstars every day. And their production is unbelievable. So, when we want to develop as artists, we need to develop also our production. Yeah. And and the whole setup. And it's not cheap. <laughs> it's not cheap. No, you need a lot of people and stuff like that. Yeah. But we're very fortunate to do what we do. A hundred percent. Real... Ole ne Ole Ilenio wants to know what is your favorite trance classic? Ah, uh, putting you on the spot. Sandcastles. Sandcastles. Okay. Is that a trance? So, I guess it's Euro dance kind of. The mm. Infandal. Okay. What? Okay. So um, this is not Paul trance. Van Dyke, <laughs> Paul Van Dyke for for oh, an yeah. angel. Yeah. yeah. I think even now Castles in the Sky is definitely a trance record as well. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent because it was. Oh, Melodic, but that's not a, was, that's not the one I mean. Which one do you mean? No, I mean Sandcastles, the Sony Sony remix. Uh, Sandcastles. Um, Dennis Ferrer and the yeah and um, Sandcastles. Wait a minute. Let me Google this. Yeah, <laughs> I what think is, we need to Google. Yeah, what is this called? The guy. Um, the Dennis Ferrer Sandcastles. Sandcastle. Sandcastles. Uh, wait. Professional podcasters, by the way, guys. We well, are we'll become prepared. <laughs> well, we'll take. Um, it's not Castles in the Sky? N- no, not, that's not my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take Paul van Dijk for an age. Okay, that's, that's a, amazing. And that's a good one. Yeah, Definitely. that one's amazing. St. Castles, Sun. Yeah, I'm now very curious. Yeah, I'm kind of curious yeah. as well, like which, which it is. Uh, I'm going to figure it out. Okay, yeah. let us know. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, Mike zero oh zero point four uh, would like to know who are you collabing with at the moment for Future Rave? For Future Rave, I do Future Rave with David Guetta. So um, that's no one else. That's yeah, that's that's me and David's project together. But you know, David he works with a lot of different artists, and I I work with a lot of different artists. I have um, is it Farah and and Sodenham, Sandcastles? Which one? So- Maybe play it on on the on your microphone. Yeah, but this is the wrong remix. So I need to see here. I think it's Sunham. Yeah. Talking about perseverance, like <laughs> just can't let yeah, it go. Yeah, because this is this is, uh, this, is this is gonna bug us. Yeah, this is a DJ. No, but thing. I, I'm like I'm not so good with um. I'm, yeah, I'm not so good with the uh, what's it called um. Yeah, this one. That is old yeah, it's Farrah and Sonnenham, Sandcastles. I remember this one. Okay. Talking about maybe Ibiza it's not so tracks. Much, maybe it's not so much trance. This is a progressive, like a yeah, it's, Ibiza classic. 100%. Yeah, yeah, it's not trance. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Paul van Dyke. For an angel. Yeah. We can all agree on that one. Jacqueline yeah. wants to know, what advice would you have given your younger self? Um... I would really have liked to learn the piano like to the fullest. That yeah. would have helped me a lot in making music today to really learn it. I took piano lessons in Los Angeles five years ago for two, three years. And it's harder to learn the older you are. As a kid, it's a lot easier. So I wish that I would really have learned it in a really young age. Too. Yeah. Okay. That's a good one, I think. Um, Seth the Busher wants to know what music production trick... Or plug-in made a difference for you in the last couple of 
let's say months? In the last couple of months, mm, I would I would say that I recently got the full pack of um, and uh, of Nexus, and that's that really made a lot of yeah? things. Yeah, that made that's a lot a of things easier. Four? I started to use uh, Sabra Two and Silent a lot, and and today, you know. If you want to make something, you can go on YouTube and you can Google how do I make true. this. Yeah. And it, it became a lot easier today to make music and it's almost bulletproof. You know, today I think it's the taste and the, 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 the mind and the creative process about making a record compared to 20 years ago where it was like, wow, how did they make it? Yeah. Today it's more like, wow, I like... The idea. Yeah, yeah, the idea, you know, because we can almost, all of us, Go from A to B and yeah, because and AI, a record. AI is helping out a lot also now. Yeah, true, true. I actually don't use that. I use YouTube, but it's true. You can, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, hundred percent. You uh, use that chat GPT, so you say, well, "Why am I kick and bass facing?" <laughs> no, no, not really. <laughs> but you know, in all honesty, so uh, I, I recently started a project with uh, Estiva called uh, Ebenezer, and we were doing. Um, a show at Dream State, yeah, for Dreams for Insomniac in in America. Yeah, when I met you. Yeah, exactly. And so for the intro of that show, we made an intro, and we asked Chat GPT to write a poem. Oh, uh, yeah. about a young guy in Amsterdam, a football player, which is Brian Broby, which okay. we based the name on Ebenezer, and we wrote write something about an uh, Amsterdam, some typical phrases about Amsterdam, and about the football player Brian Broby. And it gave us like a poem, yeah. which we used in yeah. our track. Yeah, yeah, it's so cool. So that's how I guess yeah. you can use AI nowadays. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did that with a few tracks. I, I always feel like it's just always come up if you write something with nightlife and cities. and It's always like, Tokyo nightlife is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the purple lights. Is all, is all, yeah, no, no, I see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> that will make sense. Yeah, it's cool. Well, I mean, there's so much tools coming in and you can just... Embrace them and use them in, in your own ideas, I guess, and give it your own mind, would you say? As yeah, well. yeah. Definitely. Um, Tony Ross wants to know which future rave artists are impressing you the most at the moment? Hmm. I think, you know, uh, <laughs> your guy Armin and, and, and the new record from Armin and... Um, Artbat. Artbat is not future rave, but... It, it sort of is. No. It has a little bit of a flavor to it, and I'm very impressed by this production. It's amazing. Maybe we should do something with Arbat also. Yeah. Hey. Well, let's see. <laughs> oh, and, and Armin as well. Yeah, definitely. You should do that. Um, let's uh, let's round it off. Uh, this Friday, you're playing for State of Trends for us in Rotterdam. It's your second State of Trends show because you joined us already in London last year as well. Yep. Um, what kind of impression did the crowd leave you back then? Yeah, it was beautiful. Um, it was uh, the first time I played State of Trance and I had a little bit of like anxiety before. Like, what am I supposed to do for all these people here? Yeah, you know, like, that, but but I think, you know, like a State of Trance, they also want to present other genres of music into their audience yeah. and develop. Of course, people go to a State of Trance, they want to listen to trance. But uh, I, I don't know, but I would think that after six hours, when you hear a lot of trance, mm -hmm. It's nice to also have a break from it. So a guy like me coming in and play my own music and use, you know, trance and some breakdowns on how I incorporate trance in my music, maybe it's a little bit of a nice twist. So I try to walk into the set with like the idea of like, okay, I'm here and I can take people on a little bit different journey than they are maybe used to. So I had a beautiful experience because the crowd was amazing mm -hmm. and it was like a, a warm late summer night in London yeah. and... Um, I didn't know that the trans community is so excited and so happy and so, I mean crazy. Well, they were uh, like going wild for you. It was yeah. so good to see. Yeah, it was cool. So uh, on Friday, I'm very excited. Awesome. I'm uh, I can't wait. Well, there's a lot of trendy records that you made as well, like Lost in the Rhythm yes. and Something to Hold On. And, yes, you know those are tracks that I think are very trendy because they speak to your emotions. Yeah, it's emotional records. Yeah, but we are very in 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 we are very. Uh, Inspired by trance, mm -hmm. you know, like I told you before, I think that that the, the 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 best, you know, progressions, chord progressions, and melodies and emotion comes from trance music, and uh, it's very important for for us to to incorporate that and for me to have that a part of my music, you yeah. know. 
Well, that's a good one to round off this episode. Thank you so much, Morten, for joining us and answering all these questions. Looking forward to seeing you on stage this Friday for a state of trance. Um, that's it for this podcast. Make sure to follow our playlist and check everything out. I'll see you next time for a new one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Check all previous episodes on YouTube or your favorite podcast portal.